Well, uh, let me extend greetings to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and let me extend uh, my thanks to Pastor McShaffrey and to the officers and the members of the Five Solas Church for hosting this conference and for inviting me and the rest of us who are guests here to take part in it. It is indeed an honor to be here and to address this most important subject, the defense of the text of the Word of God. The theme for this conference, as has been mentioned, is Received Text Apologetics. What do we mean by the received text? By the received text, we mean the traditional Protestant text of the Bible. That is, the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Old Testament, and the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text, of the Greek New Testament. Our position is best expressed in the Westminster Confession of Faith of 1646 and its daughter confessions in chapter 1 and paragraph 8, which affirms that Scripture has not only been immediately inspired by God in the original Hebrew and Greek but it has also been kept pure in all ages by God's singular care and providence. Our view might rightly then be called the confessional text position or confessional bibliology since it is rooted in this confessional affirmation. It is also the Reformation text. We could call it the apostolic text. It's the text of the people of God, it's the word of God given to the people of God, inspired by God, preserved by God. Whereas modern textual criticism is based on an enlightenment influence reconstruction method born in the 19th century, the confessional text position is based on a pre-critical preservation model. So that's what we mean by received text, and we spent a lot of time talking about that Last year, I'm going to assume most of you are familiar with that. What do we mean by apologetics? Well, Christian has already spoken to that. The English word apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, referring to a defense of the faith. And as uh, Pastor Christian spoke already on 1 Peter 3.15, uh, we were exhorted to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer. And in 1 Peter 3.15, that word rendered in the authorized version as answer behind it is the Greek word apologia. We should be ready to give a defense to every man that asks of us a reason for the hope that is within us with meekness and fear. In the three lectures I will be presenting in this conference, I want to address how we can defend the faith, in particular defend the word of God with respect to three audiences taking our cue from 1 Corinthians 1, verses 20 and 21. First, we will address reasoning with the wise and the scribe. By this, we will mean the professional academic scholar. What does confessional bibliology have to say to someone in the academy? Second, we will address reasoning with the disputer of this age. That'll be tomorrow morning. By this, we will mean those evangelical apologists who have embraced the modern critical text and its modern translations, while they have also challenged and spurned the received text. What does confessional bibliology have to do with modern evangelicals who make disputations against the traditional text? And in, this, in, then in the third lecture, also tomorrow morning, we will address reasoning with them that believe. By this, we will mean reasoning about the scriptures with ordinary Christians, whether they be officers in the church or persons in the pew. What does confessional bibliology have to say to the man in the pulpit and in the pew? So for this evening, it's reasoning with the wise and the scribe. In this first lecture, we ask, what does the received text have to do with the professional academic scholar? I want to focus, in particular in this lecture, on the scholarly and popular work of Dr. Bart D. Ehrman, 
an avowed agnostic who has exercised considerable influence in recent decades in the academic study of the text of the New Testament. According to the biography provided on his website at bartehrman.com, Ehrman is the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor of Religion at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I went to uh, Wake Forest University, which was a rival of UNC, and we always said we learned our ABCs, anybody but Carolina. But anyways, Ehrman teaches at UNC Chapel Hill. He completed his Master of Divinity and Doctor of Philosophy degrees at Princeton Seminary. His doctoral dissertation was completed in 1985 under Bruce Manning Metzger, perhaps the most influential New Testament textual critic of the 20th century, especially in the English-speaking world. Ehrman began his teaching career at Rutgers and in 1988 came to the University of North Carolina. He is internationally recognized as a scholarly expert on the New Testament and early Christianity, having written or edited some 30 books, as well as numerous scholarly articles in top academic journals. Ehrman has served in various influential editorial roles for academic journals and presses. He currently serves as co-editor of the esteemed series New Testament Tools, Studies, and Documents, published by E.J. Brill. His textbook, The New Testament, A Historical Introduction to the Early Christian Writings, published by Oxford University Press, is now in its seventh edition as of 2019. A condensed version of this work, titled A Brief Introduction to the New Testament, also from Oxford, is on its fifth edition as of 2020. These are among the most widely used textbooks for the study of New Testament and Christian origins in religion departments around the world. He has also written six books for a general audience, which have appeared on the New York Times bestseller list. The first of those was this book, Misquoting Jesus, The Story Behind Who Changed the Bible and Why. It was published by HarperCollins in 2005. This breakthrough book presented and explained the fruits of late 20th and early 21st century modern textual criticism for a wide popular audience. And we'll return to the book in a few moments. For now, I want to trace two of Ehrman's most significant academic contributions to modern textual criticism. First, Ehrman was instrumental in promoting an idea that nearly completely flipped what had been the conventional perspective on the variants found among the New Testament manuscripts. The traditional Christian view, articulated by early ecclesiastical writers like the father of church history, Eusebius of Caesarea, Irenaeus of Lyon, and Tertullian of Carthage, was that the Christian scriptures had been carefully safeguarded, defended by the Orthodox. And this had happened since the time of the apostles. For example, it was Irenaeus who decried the fact that Marcion, a Gnostic heretic, had mutilated the Gospel of Luke. He'd taken the Gospel of Luke, mutilated, he took Paul's epistle, epistles, mutilated them, took them down to ten letters and changed those letters. And so the thought was that the Orthodox defended the integrity of the Scriptures and they criticized anyone who attempted to change them, the heretics who attempted to change them. Tertullian of Carthage said the same thing. He attacked Marcion as being that pontic mouse who has gnawed the Gospels. That was the traditional view. Ehrman, however, turned this perspective on its head in his paradigm-shifting monograph titled The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture. Subtitled, The Effects of Early Christological Controversies on the Text of the New Testament. This was published by Oxford in 1993. In the introduction to this work, Ehrman begins, quote, My thesis can be stated simply. Scribes occasionally altered the words of their sacred texts to make them more patently orthodox and to prevent their misuse by Christians who espoused aberrant views, end quote. In the opening chapter, Ehrman proceeds to sketch what he calls the socio-historical context for the phenomenon which he describes as the orthodox 
corruption of Scripture. See, it was the Orthodox who corrupted the Scriptures, not the heretics. In the opening chapter of the book, Ehrman uh, makes plain that his thesis is indebted to a German scholar named Walter Bauer, who in 1934 had written an important book. It's translated under the English title, Orthodoxy and Heresy in Earliest Christianity. Ehrman calls this book, quote, possibly the most significant book on early Christianity written in modern times, end quote. He explains, quote, Bauer argued that the early Christian church, in fact, did not comprise a single orthodoxy from which emerged a variety of competing heretical minorities. Instead, early Christianity embodied a number of divergent forms, no one of which represented the clear and powerful majority of believers against all others, end quote. Ehrman borrowed from Bauer the idea that there was not one orthodox Christianity in accord with the apostles that was opposed by emerging heretical offshoots, but that heretical groups had just as legitimate a claim to authentic Christianity as did the orthodox. In fact, it was they, the heretics, who sometimes properly transmitted the earliest Christian traditions, which were then suppressed and corrupted by the orthodox. Second, his second major contribution, the shifting goals of modern textual criticism. He was influential in shifting the perceived goal of textual criticism from the modern or early modern goal of recovering the original autograph or authorial text to the postmodern or late modern goal of simply describing what scholars called the initial text what the Germans called the Ausgangstext, meaning the text as far back as it might be uncovered without any definitive claim to it being the original text. Contemporary textual criticism, under the influence of men like Bart Ehrman, no longer claim to be able accurately to reconstruct the authoritative autograph. Rather, they say, than there being one definitive text, they prefer to speak of the many texts, plural, of the New Testament. Rather than examining the extant textual evidence in order to recover the original, textual critics now examine this material in search of so-called windows into early Christianity. Ehrman articulated these seminal views in a groundbreaking essay that was titled The Text as Window, subtitled New Testament Manuscripts, and the social history of Christianity, early Christianity. It appeared in a book he co-edited with Michael W. Holmes in 1995, The Text of the New Testament in Contemporary Research, subtitled Essays on the Status Questionis. By the way, that book was dedicated as follows, a volume in honor of Bruce M. Metzger. That essay begins, quote, the ultimate goal of textual criticism in the judgment of most of its practitioners is to reconstruct the original text of the New Testament, end quote. He soon adds, however, quote, at the same time, many textual critics have come to recognize that an exclusive concentration on the autographs can prove myopic as it overvalues the value of variant forms of the text as it, as it overlooks, rather, the value of variant forms of the text for historians interested in matters other than exegesis, end quote. The essay ends with this conclusion, quote, much more, however, is left to be done. Modern text critics will always say, there's much, much more that needs to be done. Much more needs to be done, he says, both on these issues and on others. As we move beyond a narrow concern for the autographs, to an interest in the history of their transmission, a history that can serve as a window into the social world of early Christianity, end quote. Other scholars were working along similar lines and taking their trajectory even further. Preeminent among them was D.C. Parker of the University of Birmingham. He rejected even more emphatically the old goal of reconstructing the autograph in his landmark work, The Living Text of the Gospels, published by Cambridge in 1997, he declared, quote, generally debate has centered on the meaning of a single authoritative text, but it will soon become plain that such a text does not exist today and never has existed. 
and that therefore the theological arguments built on such a text are castles in the air, end quote. Well, that's the two things that Ehrman, in the academic world, the impact that he had. The Orthodox corrupted the scriptures, and we can't really determine what the originals are, but we can use the textual transmission history as a window into the social world of early Christianity. That's his academic work, which people might not be as aware of, but his academic work gets put into and popularized in his, in, uh, popularized in his popular work. Not only has Ehrman been influential in the scholarly guild, but he's also made his mark as a popular public intellectual. I noted earlier his first New York Times bestseller, Misquoting Jesus, the story behind who changed the Bible and why. In this book, Ehrman presents the findings of modern textual criticism for a general reading audience in a clear, accessible, and interesting manner. Even now, 17 years after this book first appeared, it is still worth reading, at the least, to understand modern academic textual criticism. Christian said earlier, you should even read people who disagree with you. This would be a good book to read, just to get the lay of the land for how modern critical um, scholars approach the New Testament, what their presuppositions are, what their findings are. So I want to turn and I want to look at some highlights from Metzger's book, Misquoting Jesus. So first of all, you'll notice that the book is dedicated to whom? To Bruce M. Metzger. In the introduction, Ehrman notes that the topic of textual criticism had occupied him, this is in 2005, for some 30 years. He describes his own personal story. He tells about how his study of the text of scriptures had disrupted his spiritual life, his pure spiritual perspectives, and his beliefs. He tells about how his religious approach to the Bible shifted as he moved from being a professed believer to being an unbeliever as a direct result of his academic study of the text of the Bible. Ehrman begins by describing his family's nominal participation in an Episcopal church in his home state of Kansas. As a sophomore in high school, he had a so-called born-again experience through his participation in a Campus Life Youth for Christ club. He was especially struck by how the leader of this group in his high school knew and taught the Bible. By the time he had finished high school, Ehrman was intent on, on becoming what he calls a serious Christian. So he went in 1973 to Moody Bible Institute, where Bible is our middle name. At that time, he would gladly have affirmed his belief in the verbal, plenary inspiration of Scripture. At Moody, Ehrman says he learned, quote, the basics of the field of textual criticism from an evangelical perspective, end quote. He learned that, quote, we don't actually have the original writings of the New Testament, but only error-ridden copies that we must try to reconstruct, end quote. After completing his three-year Bible diploma at Moody, he went to evangelical flagship Wheaton with the desire, quote, to become an evangelical voice in secular circles by getting degrees that would allow me to teach in secular settings while retaining my evangelical commitments, end quote. And I can't tell you the stories of how many people I've known who've gone off to major universities because they've wanted to be an evangelical voice in the secular setting. But rather than those persons having influence on the academy, what happens is the academy has an influence on them. At Wheaton, Ehrman majored in English, but he also took classes in Greek with respected New Testament scholar Gerald Hawthorne. As he learned more about the text of the New Testament, Ehrman writes, quote, I kept reverting back to my basic question. How does it help us to say that the Bible is the inerrant word of God if, in fact, we don't have the words that God inerrantly inspired? but only the words copied by the scribes. 
What good is it, he's writing, to say that the autographs, that is the originals, were inspired? We don't have the originals. We only have error-laden copies. And the vast majority of these are centuries removed from the originals and different from them, evidently, in thousands of ways, end quote. With these doubts plaguing his mind, he went to Princeton Seminary, intent on getting to the bottom of things by studying textual criticism with the renowned Bruce Manning Metzger. Ehrman says a turning point came in his second semester at Princeton in a New Testament class when the professor remarked, maybe Mark, meaning the evangelist Mark, just made a mistake. With this, Ehrman says, Quote, the floodgates opened, end quote. The torrent, he says, continued when he discovered that the extant copies of the New Testament differed from one another in many thousands of places. He adds, quote, there are more differences among our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament, end quote. He specifically notes how his so-called faith was left in tatters by what he perceived was a disconnect between Christian claims for the inspiration of Scripture and the lack of any meaningful explanation of the preservation of Scripture. He explains, quote, If one wants to insist that God inspired the very words of Scripture, what would be the point if we don't have the very words of Scripture? In some places, we simply cannot be sure that we have reconstructed the original text accurately. It's a bit hard to know what the words of the Bible mean if we don't even know what the words are, end quote. He continues, quote, This became a problem for my view of inspiration, for I came to realize that it would have been no more difficult for God to preserve the words of Scripture than it would have been for him to inspire them in the first place. The fact that we don't have the words surely must show, I reasoned, that he did not preserve them for us. And if he didn't perform that miracle, there seemed to be no reason to think that he performed the earlier miracle of inspiring those words, end quote. The disconnect between the inspiration of Scripture and the preservation of Scripture, Ehrman says, resulted in what he calls a radical shift and a seismic change in his understanding of the Bible. He writes, quote, The Bible began to appear to me as a very human book. This was a human book from beginning to end, end quote. In a Q&A addendum to the book, Ehrman explains that his rejection of the Bible did not immediately result in his deconversion. At first, he moved from being an evangelical to joining a liberal mainstream Protestant church, which, he says, saw the Bible as conveying in some sense God's word, but not as a book that contained the very words of God. He explains that it took him seven or eight more years till he became an agnostic, triggered by his inability to reconcile the existence of God with the problem of evil. The main thing we learn in the introduction to this book is that it was Ehrman's exposure to the evangelical construal of modern textual criticism that resulted in his rejection of the Bible's authority. And when that collapsed, the demise of his so-called faith inevitably followed. In further chapters, after the, after the introduction, he explains to the general popular audience what modern textual criticism has discovered about the Bible. And one of the things that he describes is how there are so many scribal errors and there are so many points of confusion in the transmission process. At one point, he offers this explanation. He says, given the problem, how can we get back to anything like the original text, the text that an author actually wrote? It is an enormous problem. In fact, it is such an enormous problem that a number of textual critics have started to claim that we may as well suspend any discussion of the so-called original text because it is inaccessible to us, end quote. He likely had in mind here someone like D.C. Parker. And interestingly enough, even Ehrman suggests that such skepticism at this point in his career at least may be going too far. 
Nevertheless, he concludes, quote, and so we must rest content knowing that getting back to the earliest attainable version is the best we can do, whether or not we have reached back to the original text, end quote. So the best we can do is reconstruct the so-called initial text. The best we can do is give some estimation of what the Bible maybe looked like in the third century or the fourth century, but we can't reconstruct the original. He proceeds to note, interestingly enough, even though modern textual criticism can't really determine what the Bible is, that they can tell us that there are some parts that are actually not part of the original. These include, of course, first of all, the woman taken in adultery passage, John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Ehrman notes that this story is not found in the oldest and best manuscripts, that its writing style is very different from what we find in the rest of John, and he adds, the conclusion is unavoidable. This passage was not originally part of John. He even notes that this passage is found in different locations in some manuscripts, including after John 21, 25 and after Luke 21, 38. These passages that they can determine are not part of the text, even though they can't determine what the text actually is, also include the traditional ending of Mark. Ehrman notes it is absent from our two oldest and best manuscripts of Mark's gospel. And he says the writing style varies from what we find elsewhere in Mark. He concludes that, quote, nearly all textual scholars, end quote, are convinced that these verses are an addition to Mark. Ehrman traces the transition of the New Testament to the fourth century and to the early era of printing. When it comes to Erasmus's first edition of the Greek New Testament of 1516, one finds in Ehrman's discussion many of the same unfounded and legendary anecdotes that continue to circulate today. And Christian made reference to several of these, including the idea that Ehrman had rushed uh, that 1516 first edition to print, the idea that the edition was based on merely a handful of late medieval manuscripts, the idea that Erasmus had access to only one copy of the book of Revelation, a commentary that he had borrowed from Reuchlin, and it didn't have the last page, and it didn't have the last six verses, and so he had to back tra tr translate from Latin into Greek. Uh, those are scholarly anecdotes. There's no firm evidence for any of those anecdotes, but they continue to circulate among scholars even today, and, and Ehrman promotes them just as well. Of course, he also talks about the so-called rash wager. The coma Ioanneum, 1 John 5, 7, and 8, wasn't in the first two editions of Erasmus, but he included it in the third edition after folk began to complain that that passage was part of the true word of God. But the scholarly anecdote says that he created a rash wager that if anybody could produce a manuscript, that he would include it, and then someone created that manuscript to prove the point. It's an interesting story, but uh, it's been shown by the um, uh, Dutch scholar Hank de Jong that that's a scholarly anecdote without any primary source material to back it up. But Ehrman basically casts aspersions on, on Erasmus because he knows that Erasmus is uh, there at the beginning stages of the, of the traditional Protestant text. He also uh, says some disparaging things about the King James Version. He says that passages like the traditional ending of Mark and the woman taken in adultery and the coma Ioanneum only were introduced into uh, the, the language, the English Bibles, uh, by its inclusion in the King James Version in 1611, overlooking the fact that all three of those, the woman taken in adultery, the traditional ending of Mark, and the coma Ioanneum were there in Tyndale's uh, English Bible in 1525, but uh, it's, everything is sort of dumped on the King James Version to sort of say what a sorry record it had, including these things within it. There is no room in Ehrman's worldview for the providential work of God. At one point, he says that passages like the Pericope Adulteri, the traditional ending of Mark, only entered into the English stream of consciousness merely by a chance of history based on the manuscripts that Erasmus just happened to have handy to him. No place for the providential work of God. As a friend of mine likes to say, as luck would have it, providence kicked in. He notes how Erasmus's Greek New Testament was used by Protestant scholars in their editions of the Textus Receptus, observing, quote, 
It was the inferior textual form of the Textus Receptus that stood at the base of the earliest English translations, including the King James Bible and other editions until the end of the 19th century, end quote. Ehrman also gives attention to the splash made by John Mill's Greek New Testament of 1707, which had, he says, a cataclysmic effect on textual criticism. As Mill's work included reference to no less than 30,000 variants among the New Testament manuscripts, which he had tabulated in 30 years of labor. According to Ehrman, this startled the reading public as the status of the original text was thrown wide open to dispute. For, he says, if one did not know which words were original to the Greek New Testament, how could one use these words in deciding correct Christian doctrine and teaching? Ehrman notes, again, that was Mills in 1707. He notes that in his day in 2005, some were now estimating that the number of variants was at 200,000, 300,000, or even 400,000 among the extant uh, uh, Greek New Testament witnesses. He says, quote, there are more variations among our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament, end quote. Well, that's a little taste of some of the things in misquoting Jesus. It was indeed a resounding publishing success, which generated significant popular interest at the time in various questions related to the study of the text of the New Testament and early Christianity. It also made Ehrman a sort of minor celebrity at the time as he appeared on late night talk shows. He was on the Colbert show talking about his book. Uh, he did interviews with NPR. And so uh, there was a, uh, I don't know if you, some of you remember in 2005, there was a lot of buzz, a lot of discussion about Ehrman's book, Misquoting Jesus. In the years since, he produced a series of further per popular works on various topics, many of which continued to challenge traditional Christian views. They included in 2008 a book titled God's Problem, How the Bible Fails to Answer Our Most Important Question, Why We Suffer. He uh, published a book in 2011 titled Forged, Writing in the Name of God, Why the Bible's Authors Are Not Who We Think They Are, popularizing the view of pseudonymous authorship of the Gospels. Matthew didn't really write Matthew. Paul didn't really write all the epistles attributed to him and so forth. He wrote a book in 2006 titled Jesus Before the Gospels, How the Earliest Christians Remembered, Changed, and Invented Their Stories of the Savior. It should also be noted that misquoting Jesus provoked an immediate response from various evangelical authors and theologians who took exception to various aspects of his book, most notably regarding statements related to the inspiration, authority, and reliability of the New Testament. There were several book-length responses to Ehrman, including Timothy Paul Jones's book in 2007 from InterVarsity Press titled Misquoting Truth, a guide to the fallacies of Ehrman's misquoting Jesus. A few years later, Andreas J. Kostenberger and Michael J. Kruger produced a book titled The Heresy of Orthodoxy, How Contemporary Culture's Fascination with Diversity Has Reshaped Our Understanding of Early Christianity from Crossway in 2010. This book specifically challenged what it called the Bauer-Ehrman thesis regarding orthodoxy and heresy in early Christianity, and defended a more traditional uh, Christian perspective on the topic. Aside from works in print, Ehrman's writings also evoked an avalanche of online resources responding to his work. And this created a veritable cottage industry of materials dedicated presumably to anti-Ehrman apologetics. In 2011, Miles O'Neill, a campus ministry worker with Campus Crusade for Christ at UNC Chapel Hill, launched the website airmanproject.com, as well as a corresponding YouTube channel, as a resource to respond to Dr. Ehrman's popular teaching. This site includes short videos from various well-known evangelicals, including D.A. Carson, Michael J. Kruger, Dan Wallace, and Daryl Bach, among others. One of the videos on the Airman Project site is titled Mark 16, 9 through 20, 
and features Daniel Wallace. You can search for it on YouTube and find it. If you look at that video, you will see that Wallace starts off with a lot of bluster, saying, Ehrman didn't prove anything against Christianity. He didn't say anything in that book that we didn't already know. And then he talks about Mark 16, 9 through 20. And after the opening bluster, he says, he didn't tell us anything we didn't know. We, we knew that Mark 16, 9 through 20 wasn't authentic. We know that it's not in the earliest and best manuscripts. His refutation of Ehrman is, in fact, complete agreement with him. Aside from print and internet, there, is all, there have also been several notable debates, or as I like to call them, joint appearances, with Dr. Ehrman by several evangelicals. You might not have heard about this one, maybe you have, but the popular internet apologist James White debated Ehrman on January the 21st of 2009. Neither White nor his ministry have yet revealed how much Ehrman was paid to appear at this event, but it seems clear that James White likely got his money's worth with respect to promotion of himself and his ministry. Oddly enough, James White has claimed that he prevailed in this debate, but it is clear to anyone with some knowledge of the discipline that Ehrman came off as an acknowledged expert in the field of textual criticism, while James White came off only as someone who aspired to this level of expertise. When Ehrman posted videos of this debate to his blog in 2014, he wrote, I wasn't sure whether I should post this debate or not. Frankly, it was not a good experience. I normally do not have an aversion to the people I debate, but James White is that kind of fundamentalist who gets under my skin. Ehrman has also, at least three times, had dialogues or debates with Daniel C. Wallace of Dallas Seminary. The first was on April the 4th, 2008, at the Greer Heard Point Counterpoint Forum held at the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Another was held on October the 1st of 2011 at Southern Methodist University on the topic, Can We Trust the Text of the New Testament? A debate between Bart Ehrman and Daniel Wallace. I believe this one was done as a fundraiser for Wallace's Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. A video of this event, copyrighted to both Ehrman and the CSNTM Productions, is posted to Ehrman's YouTube channel and has over 500,000 views as of this month. Finally, another uh, such event between Ehrman and Wallace was held on February the 1st of 2012 on the campus at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in an event that was hosted by the Ehrman Project and moderated by Miles O'Neill. This event was titled, Is the Original New Testament Text Lost? A Dialogue with Bart D. Ehrman and Daniel B. Wallace. I might have called him Daniel C. Wallace earlier. It's Daniel B. Wallace. This video is on YouTube, and it has over 100,000 views. It was at this event that Wallace made the startling claim that a first century fragment of Mark had been confirmed. When this fat fragment was actually published in 2018, however, it was determined not, in fact, to date from the first century, much to Wallace's professional embarrassment. It is clear that controversy between airmen and some evangelicals has been both popular and likely lucrative for many. In the end, however, we can only conclude that the evangelical outrage over Bart Ehrman and his ideas is more than a little ironic, if not hypocritical. Given the fact that the primary views and conclusions espoused and promoted by Ehrman are generally identical with those espoused and promoted by most evangelical scholars who have embraced modern textual criticism. As Ehrman points out in an addendum to misquoting Jesus, the views he put forward about the New Testament in that book, he says, are well known by pastors and teachers trained in modern textual criticism, even in modern evangelical seminaries. The problem, he says, is that they have been reluctant or unable to communicate this message to a broad audience. After noting that the strongest objections against his book came from evangelical Bible scholars, Ehrman observes, quote, 
What has struck me about this objection is that it has to do with the impression left by the book rather than about anything I actually say in the book. The truth is that evangelical scholars who embrace the modern critical text and the modern critical text method have little to offer in objection against what Ehrman says in his book. Why? Because they essentially agree with him. In some cases, he even takes a more conservative position than they do. I was struck when I read through the reread through the book that Ehrman actually defends the authenticity of our Lord's Prayer in Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He thinks it was excised by Orthodox scribes who were anti-Semitic and didn't like the idea of Jesus praying for his Jewish persecutors. Well, oddly enough, he defends the authenticity of that part of the traditional text, whereas an evangelical uh, like James White says that that passage isn't authentic and should be taken out of our Bibles. But again, the reason that they evangelicals don't have much ground for, for criticizing Ehrman is that they by and large agree with him. Let me just give you some quotes to illustrate this. In misquoting Jesus, Ehrman writes the following. In some places in the New Testament, we simply cannot be sure that we have reconstructed the original text accurately. It's a bit hard to know what the words of the Bible mean if we don't know what the words are. That's Ehrman in Misquoting Jesus, page 11. In his foreword to the Myths and Mistakes book, Daniel Wallace writes, this is now becoming a famous quotation of his, we do not now have in our critical Greek texts or any translations exactly what the authors of the New Testament wrote even if we did, we would not know it. In misquoting Jesus, Ehrman says that his belief in the inspiration of Scripture collapsed because he could not affirm the doctrine of the preservation of Scripture. In a contribution that Dan Wallace made to a book on the ending of Mark titled the book was titled The Perspectives on the Ending of Mark, he wrote the following. I don't hold to the doctrine of preservation. That doctrine, first formulated in the Westminster Confession of Faith, has a poor biblical base. I do not think that the doctrine is defensible, either exegetically or empirically. In misquoting Jesus, Ehrman says that the original autographs cannot be reliably reconstructed. The best, he says, that we can do is get back to the earliest attainable version. In their introduction to the Coherence-Based Genealogical Method, a book titled A New Approach to Textual Criticism, an Introduction to the Coherence-Based Genealogical Method, Tommy Wasserman, a Swedish Baptist evangelical, and Peter J. Gurry from Phoenix Seminary write the following. Textual criticism is a discipline that tries to restore the text. Where that is not possible, it aims to reach back as closely to the initial text as it can. You see how that's the same perspective. In misquoting Jesus... Ehrman says Mark 16, 9 through 20 is missing in the two best and earliest Greek manuscripts and that its writing style is not Markan. Therefore, it is spurious. In my debate online with James White on the traditional ending of Mark, James White expressed essentially his agreement with Ehrman. In fact, he went even further than Ehrman once again. He said that the traditional ending of Mark, which appears in 99.9% .9 of our extant Greek manuscripts, which is cited in the second century by Justin Martyr and Irenaeus of Lyon, he says that not only is it spurious, it is an unorthodox corruption. Ehrman said it's an orthodox corruption. 
the conservative, so-called, goes even more radically skeptical as viewpoint, saying it's an unorthodox corruption of the gospel of Mark. In misquoting Jesus, Ehrman says that the woman taken in adultery passage, John 7.53 through 8.11, is a late addition to the text of John. He says its style does not match the rest of John, and it's a floating tradition. In the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, published by Crossway in 2017, compiled by evangelical scholars and edited by Dirk Yonkend, they removed this passage, John 7, 53 through 8, 11, from the text proper of the Gospel of John and relegated it to the footnotes. In misquoting Jesus, Ehrman, drawing upon the work of Mills, suggests that there are anywhere between 200,000 to 400,000 variants in the New Testament uh, manuscript tradition. And therefore, we can't determine what the original text was. Peter Gurry, co-editor of the book Myths and Mistakes, and his contribution to that book, reassures his evangelical audience. Listen, don't worry about that. In fact, he says, there are half a million variants. What Ehrman said, he pushes 100,000 more without giving us much assurance of any ability ever for modern textual criticism to be able to reconstruct what the original of the New Testament is. In his 2019 monograph, Bart Ehrman argued that the text of the New Testament shows evidence of what he calls the orthodox corruption of Scripture. Also in the Myths and Mistakes book of 2019, in an article written by a fellow named Richard Marcello, he says that although Ehrman's claims may be true too broad in places, quote, the central thesis that there are indeed orthodox corruptions within the manuscript tradition remains true, end quote. In other words, Ehrman is right. In his celebrated 1995 article, Texas Window, Ehrman says that rather than seeking the autograph, the goal of textual criticism is to provide a window into the social world of early Christianity. Jeremiah Coogan, also writing an article in the Myths and Mistakes book, in his chapter on ancient versions, suggests the following, quote, translations are not simply witnesses for reconstructing the text of the Greek New Testament. They are witnesses to Christian theology and practice in a ro more robust way as a window into how the early church studied, prayed, and worshiped. That's Ehrman. Do you get it? What Ehrman says modern textual critics say. There is a popular internet apologist named James White. I think I've mentioned him previously in the lecture. Maybe you've heard of him. And he has, in several presentations, made the statement that the confessional text position is dangerous. Our position is dangerous. He has also declared that if you adopt this obscurantist view that we should use the text of the Reformation and not the modern critical text, that you have no apologetic against the Bart Ehrmans of this world. Presumably, this comes from his vast experience of having once debated Ehrman 14 years ago. They've had no interaction since at an event for which Ehrman was most likely a paid participant. In what must be considered a textbook example of gaslighting, in his 2020 article critiquing confessional bibliology, Mark Ward, in that paper's final footnote, offers a quote from Dr. E.F. Hills, affirming that both inspiration and preservation must be affirmed as true doctrine. To this, Mark Ward has the audacity to add, quote, this is the very presupposition that drove Bart Ehrman out of evangelicalism 
Once he saw that the Bible was not perfectly preserved, he reasoned that it must not be inspired. End quote. So, it was that quote from E.F. Hills and not the countless hours of academic direction Ehrman received under the tutelage of Bruce Metzger to whom he devoted at least two of his books that drove him out of evangelicalism. Right. We now see the truth. It is, in fact, those who have embraced modern textual criticism, modern texts, and modern translations who have no apologetic against Bart Ehrman. Why? Because they have accepted his approach to the text of scripture, lock, stock, and barrel. It's not our view that's dangerous, but theirs. Confessional bibliology offers a real and meaningful Christian response to Bart Ehrman and others like him in the modern academy. We also duly acknowledge where Ehrman gets it right. He's right that the text of the Bible simply cannot be reconstructed using modern empirical methods. And he's right that if you don't know what the Bible is, you cannot know what the Bible says. We would add, however, that it does not need to be reconstructed. It has been inspired by God. It has been kept pure in all ages according to the all-wise providence of God. We don't answer Airmen by parroting back to him the method he's already embraced that made shipwreck of his supposed faith. If someone is suffering from alcohol poisoning, you don't try to cure him by giving him another drink. One might be tempted to play the what-if game regarding Bart Ehrman. What if in high school, in his high school days, what if at Moody, where Bible is our middle name? What if at Wheaton, or even while in a mainline Protestant seminary like Princeton, someone had introduced him to a confessional understanding of Scripture? What if someone had put in his hands the Westminster Confession of Faith rather than the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy? What if someone had given him the writings of John Owen rather than the writings of Bruce Manning Metzger? What if someone had told him that he did not have to try unsuccessfully to reconstruct the autograph? Because we have the autograph. We have it in the traditional original language texts, and it is conveyed to us in faithful translations as they accurately reflect that inspired, self-authenticating and preserved text. My belief in the perseverance of the saints, the pea and tulip, suggests to me that Ehrman did not lose his faith but that he never had true saving faith. He'd always been a false professor. Still, there are other young people, just like Ehrman, who will stand in similar places or who will follow a similar trajectory. What if a young person drawn to the gospel in high school and sent to a supposedly conservative evangelical college was not exposed to modern textual criticism? and its denial of the inspiration, preservation, and purity of the word of God. But what if instead that student was introduced to the robust, classic view of the scriptures held by the god godly Protestant men of the past? What kind of difference might this make? The time for influencing airmen may have passed. That's in God's hands. But should the Lord tarry, the time is now to provide a winsome alternative to all those considering the views that were embraced by airmen 
to his soul's detriment. Therefore, my friends, let us earnestly contend for the faith, once for all delivered unto the saints, and let us give to every man an answer with meekness and fear. Amen? Amen. Let me invite you to stand together. Let's join in prayer, and I think someone may come out up for a closing prayer after this, but let's just join with a prayer after this. Just close, brother, and I'll have some announcements. Okay, all right. Let's join in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give thee thanks again for this opportunity, this unusual assembly of people. I, I don't think this assembly of people has ever come together in one place like we have tonight from all over the country. As we've assembled here, uh, we've come together because we want to learn more about the word and we want to grow in our respect and reverence for it and most importantly in our admiration for thee and so we give thee thanks for this assembly that we've had we ask that you would bless our time of fellowship and conversation afterward as we as we uh, rekindle uh, old friendships or we make new acquaintances and uh, we join in in fellowship with like-minded brothers and sisters and so bless us and give us a good night's rest tonight we thank thee again for those who have been our hosts and who have been gracious in preparing this time and place and doing everything with such excellence for us, from the way the bulletin has been put together to the way that the service has been arranged and ordered. And so we give thee thanks for the labors that went into this before we came. And, oh God, uh, we, we ask tonight that we would not... Um, Simply stand in scorn at those who oppose us, whether it be Bart Ehrman or James White, but that uh, we would uh, stand for the truth and, again, that we would contend for it with meekness and fear. We ask this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.